Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gayoung Jang, and I'm a PhD student in Hanyang University Business School. Before joining the PhD program, I have been working as a portfolio manager who manages portfolios consisting of global fixed income assets in Korea. So today, I want to share a little bit about my experience as a portfolio manager, not as a student. And since this is an undergrad course about fixed income, I'm pretty sure that you have learned some basics about what fixed income assets are, how they differ from other assets, how to estimate the prices and such. So in this lecture today, I'll try not to bore you by repeating the technical stuff over and over that you've pretty much learned from Professor Kang and the textbook already. Instead, I'll tell you what it is like to be a portfolio manager um, especially in the fixed income market today. When you think about portfolio managers, what kind of images come to your mind? What is your description of a portfolio manager if you're ever asked such a question? Is it this person who wears a fancy suit to work every day in a place surrounded by tall buildings? Or a person who reads reports consisting of all numbers and graphs? or this person who has multiple screens on a personal desk and discusses numbers with colleagues throughout the day? Well, I'd say, in fact, these images quite closely describe the job of a portfolio manager. They do go to a tall office building or area wearing a nice suit, although not every day. They read reports that have more numbers and graphs than words. They talk to their colleagues using graphs and numbers on multiple screens, and they do spend a lot of time planning and thinking about portfolio strategies. But they may not be as good looking as these guys here, or they actually even wear casuals to work, well, pajamas even these days because they work from home. But yes, these images are somehow very accurate. So then what is it like to be a portfolio manager for real at work every day? Before we begin talking about the real life stuff, let me briefly tell you about the actual fixed income market first. So to help you understand. This is a uh, cross asset return, risk return profile I often use in lectures. The Y axis shows the expected returns and the X axis shows the expected risk, both in percentage terms. So as you go to the upper right hand side following the line, the return and risk both increase for your invested asset. The transparent red box on the left hand side covers most fix fixed income assets. So this means fixed income assets are relatively low return generating, but also low risk investment. MBS, EMBS, US government bond, US um, IGCLO, COCO bond, all of these are fixed income assets and most of them pay pre determine rates of returns on a regular basis, mostly twice a year for general fixed coupon bonds, like corporate bonds. So some may wonder if the interest rate is so low globally for most fixed income assets, why does the investor's demand for global fixed income investment increase every year? There may be various reasons for the increasing trend in foreign investors' investment in global fixed income assets. It may be that the domestic capital markets are relatively small to consume the demand from the investors like Korean investors, who therefore look for opportunities outside their own countries. Also, the interest rates were relatively higher in emerging markets before, a few years ago, but nowadays it's not so true anymore. Look at the Korean market, for example. The interest rate is close to zero, which is not enough to attract domestic investors who seek higher returns, not to mention foreign investors. Of course, there are currency-related considerations, but let's put that aside. So low interest rates result in increasing asset values, especially for fixed income investors, because you know, as the interest rate goes declines, the prices of the assets um, increases. So it makes them, the investors look for more diverse opportunities outside their own markets. And also it has become um, so much easier for domestic investors to invest in foreign investment products. So anyone can set up an account online and invest in stocks listed in the US today with minimum fees. 
So geographical or currency-wise um, diversification is another important consideration for investors who invest in overseas assets. And lastly, hedging costs are very important for foreign investors because if you invest in assets that return, let's say 5% annually, and if the hedging cost is minus 2%, the ultimate return for you is only 3%. So investors should always compare the returns after the hedging cost to the returns from domestic products. Another way to avoid high hedging cost is not to not hedge at all. So keep your investment exposed to changes in the foreign currencies. And this has been the case indeed for many investors in Korea since last year. Uh, and with dollar strengthening, investors who chose not to hedge have actually benefited from their open positions well, there is a news article reported by CNBC about the increasing demand of, of foreign investors. Let's take a look um, for a moment. So the title of the article goes, uh, Foreign Investors Flock to U.S. Corporate Bond Market for Yield. So this is an important in introduction. So, I mean, if you're interested in this finance, uh, financial market, you know, like interested in becoming, um, you know, working in the financial industry, I think uh, the important thing is that you should know what you're reading when you're reading like articles about the financial market or economics. Like it tells you a lot, of, a lot about what's going on in the market. So it goes, it says uh, foreign investors have had to pay up to hedge US dollar domain denominated assets over the last year, but this has yet to stop them from flowing money into the U.S. corporate bond market, the world's largest. So this basically means that the hedging cost uh, against the U.S. dollar has been um, increasing indeed, which is uh, not good for the investors who want to invest in overseas assets denominated in U.S. dollars. But this didn't stop them from you know, like in, uh, increasing their investment in the US dollar denominated assets because of the returns, it says. So robust returns outweighed concerns about costly dollar hedges. And a surprise shift in the Federal Reserve's monetary policy stance earlier this year from a tightening bias to a, a neutral one helped unleash foreign demand for US corporate bonds. This means um, the Fed changed their stance uh, from the tightening bias to uh, less tightening ones. So it kind of boosts the asset values and also um, drove the uh, demand for more risky uh, investment. So it explains, uh, part, partly explains the increasing demand for US corporate bonds, according to the article. Um, yeah, basically the same thing. Benign outlook for interest rate has contributed to very sizable returns. Yep, so basically this uh, mentions like European investors who are subject to very high dollar hedging cost and the Japanese buyers of the US debt who are subject to lower hedging cost. So um, mentions various foreign investors who want to invest in the US corporate market even after the hedging cost these days because the returns are greater. Um, yeah, some, so let's go back to the slides. This is a pretty common um, form of articles that portfolio managers read every day. Um, it, has, it contains a lot of information about, you know, like the, the inflows and outflows into what markets and what kind of um, draw the phenomenon. In this case, the Fed, uh, Fed stands and also it mentioned the hedging cost and a lot of different stuff, but uh, it's really important that you understand um, what they're talking about in this kind of articles. So just wanted to take a look. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So fixed income markets are much larger indeed 
uh, when compared to the size of the stock market, in, um, both in terms of the issuance and trading. So countries and local governments issue bonds, not to mention cross-national organizations like the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund. They also issue bonds in quite sizable ones. But however, most people are more familiar with stocks indeed. Um, and I think easy access is one reason because it's harder for individuals like us to have access to fixed income investment uh, compared to equities. And there are some uh, distinctive features of, of fixed income assets that differentiate them from the rest of the assets, especially the equities. So first, here we go. The fixed income investment is less transparent than stock investment because most transactions, for example, take place over the counter or through a private arrangement. And the terms are not very sized, which means I, every deal is different. So without professional assist, assistance, it's hard to know the true value of the investment opportunity for many potential investors. And also the assets um, are fundamentally different even within the fixed income universe itself. So for example, most unsecured uh, corporate bonds are different from sovereign bonds or agency bonds that are often sponsored or guaranteed by the government. They're all called bonds broadly, but you expect totally different outcomes, especially when they default. In addition, there are asset-backed securities and mortgage-backed securities that are also fixed income assets, but are very different from plain vanilla bonds for reasons you should be aware of by now. And fixed income assets um, generally have maturities, which is not the case for stocks because in stock investment, you decide when to terminate your investment. Lastly, some bonds have embedded options like call options and put options and unusual covenants that should be read with caution. So in summary, fixed income assets are far more complicated than equities, especially for rookie investors like yourselves. So I got this uh, data a few years ago, but the structure is almost the same. Um, just don't look at the numbers. So uh, within the whole fixed income universe, treasuries, which are government issued bonds, account for the highest proportion. And surprisingly, uh, mortgage related securities are the next. In the US, people mostly use mortgages to buy a house and pay back the interest and principal throughout their lives. So the mortgage market is huge and very active in the US, unlike other countries like Korea. And corporate bonds account for as much proportion mortgage securities and munis and ABS account for the lowest in terms of the outstanding amount in the US bond market. So munis are the bonds issued by state and local governments and ABS means asset backed securities, which where the assets are uh, the car or student loans, etc. Within the corporate bond university, um, in the US, investment grade bonds that are rated at or above triple B minus by credit rating agencies account for the majority of the outstanding amount, while high yield securities do also have some presence in the corporate fixed income market. Okay, so in this slide, I put a captured image from the Bloomberg terminal screen so this shows the kinds of indices produced by Bloomberg Barclays. So the most common index probably used by um, foreign investors that want to invest in global fixed income markets broadly is probably this one called Global Aggregate. So Global Aggregate Index includes fixed income assets that are um, issued by governments, supranational institutions, agencies and companies and also include securitized assets, all of which are investment grade. And by investment grade, I mean those assets that are rated by credit rating agencies to be between triple A and triple B minus or BAA3 in case of Moody's. So I think I should stop here about talking about the markets and assets because I think I'll lose your attention pretty soon. Um, so let me just uh, turn to fixed income portfolio management slides. Okay. 
There are different ways to categorize fixed income portfolios. By client type, first, you have retail investors who are mostly individuals like us who go to the bank with a license to solicit financial products or brokers to subscribe to funds that portfolio managers manage. Also, there are institutional investors who are pension funds, insurance companies and such that are not individuals. So those companies hire specialized people to work in an investment team to invest their assets through financial intermediaries like portfolio managers, or they sometimes make direct investment as well. By active needs and strategy, you have portfolios that have a passive strategy, enhanced strategy, or active strategy. A passive portfolio follows a predetermined benchmark within a certain tracking errors. And the portfolio is evaluated based on its ability to track the performance of the benchmark. On the other hand, an active portfolio has no benchmark and it's evaluated based on its absolute returns. And enhanced portfolios are in the middle. They use a mixture of both passive and active strategies because they have benchmarks, but are also evaluated by their performance over the benchmarks. Um, if you use vehicles to divide your portfolio types, you have a fund of a single fund, fund of multiple funds, fund of ETFs that is called EMP or a separately managed account called SMA. By investment approach, a top-down approach means you look at the macro factors first, like political or economic factors that can influence your portfolio returns and risk, and then look at the industry and individual companies to build and manage your portfolio. On the contrary, bottom-up portfolios focused on, uh, focus on analyzing the risk profiles and upside potential of individual companies primarily. So there are also a factor-based approach and a thematic approach among others. A thematic approach, for example, is something you look for when big events are about to happen, like the US presidential election, so if you manage a fund with a thematic approach, you basically build and manage your portfolio that consists of the securities that are related to certain themes that you choose. Um, you can also look at portfolios in regional categories. There are funds that only invest in companies residing in developed markets like Western countries or emerging markets like China and India. There are funds that invest in Asian companies only as well. And for fixed income funds, uh, the average credit rating is a very important consideration. So if you want to invest safely, you may choose portfolios that only invest in assets rated above triple B minus, which is the lowest rating for investment grade. And any rating below triple B minus or BAA3 is considered non-investment grade, speculative, high yield, or junk, which essentially mean the same thing. And also there are sector um, considerations. Some funds only invest in assets issued by governments or government related entities, while others invest in securities issued by companies only. There can be other ways to categorize portfolios, but I believe that I have um, mentioned pretty much all of them that I can think of right now. So, for the next five slides, um, I'll explain different ways to manage portfolios um, in different types of investment vehicles. So some important considerations for each vehicle. First is the separately managed account, also called SMA. This is a uh, customized way of managing portfolios for clients who seek to gain the most from the expertise of the portfolio manager they choose. This type is mostly used by institutions and high net worth individuals because of their reasons. So first, there often um, is a minimum investment amount that you have to commit, usually up from $100 million per account. And um, you also should be able to form your own investment guideline that you will use to evaluate the performance of the portfolio. So performance evaluations largely up to the client, which is hard for a common retail um, client. So SMAs also customize uh, management fees and can use any kind of strategy as suggested and determined by both the manager and client. 
So uh, regular performance updates are necessary from the manager and uh, monitoring of the performance is a job for the client. For retail customers, it's easier to invest in single funds that are traded on a platform. A single mutual fund can be an example. It allows public access and requires higher fees as a result. It usually has multiple classes depending on the fee schedules, dividend payment, client type of, or um, minimum investment requirement that has a lot to do with the fees and the client types as well. There is some transparency guaranteed by public disclosure of the mutual fund as required by the law. For example, the company that manages such funds should generate monthly fact sheets for N client. The downside is that the fund's performance and management is highly dependent on manager's discretion. So it means you cannot really know how the portfolio is managed by the manager, how and when the manager will change the strategy details and such. You just need to have faith in the portfolio manager to do their job according to the investment objective and strategy they claim to have. Um, now we have the exchange traded funds or ETFs. Uh, the, these are similar to single mutual funds, but they are traded in shares like listed companies on stock exchanges. Because they are traded like stocks, they are under the same strict uh, regulations by the exchange and regulatory bodies. And usually ETFs require lower fees than mutual funds and they have more transparency as they post um, portfolio constituents on a daily basis, for example, in Korea. And also there usually is no minimum investment requirement, but the downside is there haven't been that um, many ETFs in the market when compared to mutual funds before. So your choice was quite limited, but considering the growth of the ETF market these days, it may no longer be a problem. And another downside can be that um, because of such strict regulations and public scrutiny, more ETFs are delisted and closed than mutual funds, which may pose um, some risk to the investors because they have to move their money to another investment product involuntarily once that happens. A fund of mutual funds is nothing but a fund that invests in multiple mutual funds. So I talked about a single fund investment two slides ago, and this is not so different except for the number of funds that are subject to investment. So this is an indirect way of investing because you hire a local manager who will do the selecting job on behalf of you. The manager selects what funds to invest to meet with the investment goals of the client. And so the fees are higher because of the selecting and managing job. And customization is pretty limited because the management of mutual funds are, like I said, highly dependent on the manager's discretion, so the managers of the mutual funds. So this type of investment is actually quite suitable for first-time investors with considerable wealth because it grants them easy access to multiple funds and to the markets that they have no expertise in. So often in the investors use this vehicle to have the opportunity to learn from the famous managers as well. A fund of ETFs is similar to a fund of funds, except that the funds are ETFs, not mutual funds. So interestingly, because the underlying assets like ETFs require lower fees from the investors, EMP investment also requires lower fees when compared to investing in the fund of mutual funds. And also because the underlying assets are ETFs, not mutual funds, transparency somewhat improves in general. In managing um, EMPs, the local manager's ability may also matter more because um, she or he selects what ETF to invest in and the ETFs in the EMPs are usually passive ETFs, so the managers of the ETFs are not active managers. So I don't know if this makes sense, uh, but just you can simply see it as selecting what markets you want to invest in using the vehicle of EMPs. Okay, so let's move on to a lighter subject now. A person who manages portfolios, PMs. White is a portfolio manager. 
There are uh, numerous e descriptions on the website of Wikipedia, Investopedia, and various others about the job of a portfolio manager. So let's look at the Wikipedia definition first. So it says a portfolio manager is a professional responsible for making investment decisions and carrying out investment activities on behalf of vested individuals or institutions. Okay, in Investopedia, the description contains more words, but essentially talks about the same thing in a very broad context. And I found this chart from the website called investorsbook.com. Um, it's the first time I actually um, checked the website. And it contains the skills required for becoming a portfolio manager. So a decision-making um, ability, communication, analytical um, skills, data interpretation, uh, anticipation of the risks, uh, patience, innovative uh, minds, I guess. So quite a lot of them and quite some truth in there, but these are all very theoretical and don't really help anyone who is actually thinking of building a career as a portfolio manager. It does not really give you the picture of how the days or month go by for a portfolio manager uh, for real. So here are my stories in my words. So first, who are they? They are called by various names. So money managers, portfolio managers, PMs in short, fund managers. So I'm just gonna use PMs because it's shorter. So PMs work with marketers, sales, compliance officers, risk managers and traders and very importantly, research analyst. So they don't work alone. The, so portfolio management job is not just for the PMs. They have to work in cooperation with all these people to generate good returns and minimize risks. And the PM's primary role is, of course, to meet with clients' of investment objectives by managing their per financial portfolios. What's important is PMs are not computers. So they have opinions that are very subjective sometimes, which means, which highlights why it is important to hire a PM that can actually deliver the outcomes as you want. And uh, through the process that you can actually um, understand. So what, they, what do they do on a daily basis? Um, from my experience as a portfolio manager um, overseeing portfolios consisting of global bonds, I start my day doing the list of the things here. First, I go to the work and check emails from last night because there's a 24 hour communication going on, um, especially when you're um, investing in the global assets. And you also check for portfolio returns from last night and also other statistics like tracking error, whether it's uh, within the boundaries, or the correlations, whether it's uh, well above the 0.90, which is um, mandatory for passive ETFs, stuff like that. So check some numbers and also check for the market movement, like the benchmark weight, um, whether the treasury rates, the 10 year government bond um, weight moved up or down, the corporate spreads, the rating changes, and the outlook changes. Uh, also, you have to check for the common releases, like the some important macro um, variables, like unemployment rate, the retail, uh, CPI, PC, et cetera. And you also check for the updates in the news, anything related to the financial markets, economics, politics, et cetera. And uh, that the, all of those that can uh, influence the returns and risk of your portfolios. And you also check the fund inflows and outflows uh, from last night. So any subscriptions or redemptions that we have to be aware of, some major changes. And you also check for necessary or ideal trades for the day. So like what kind of trades you wanna execute the day for the day, or what kind of trades you have to execute um, to manage your portfolios uh, within the investment guidelines. And you also check for important 
events, like whether you have a client meetings or interviews with the press or, or you have to attend a seminar or give a seminar, stuff like that. So that's how we um, start the day. And we do this with other team members. And yeah, we do other stuff like portfolio management job. And then uh, as we um, move close to the closing hours, we check for compliance issues for the day, whether our trades uh, have violated any um, compliance matters. That's very important because we should not go home until we check that we are, we are all okay. There's no like violations and such. And we also check for the completion of all the trades that we meant to execute for the day. Okay. And on a weekly, monthly, and even annual basis, um, we have many internal meetings, like uh, um, the PMs have the strategy meeting with the analysts, um, and the, uh, they have outlook meetings, um, including the traders sometimes. And they have the performance review meetings with um, the executives and also um, periodically to the CEOs. And also business meetings that um, talk about like other important um, business stuff, like, you know, with the C among the CRP senior PMs, executives, and the CEO. And we also uh, review our portfolios, whether uh, uh, to check for its strategy fit, um, the access returns, uh, any opportunities that we are not, uh, we have to be aware of, and any risks that we have to forecast and, and prepare to avoid and stuff like that. And we also rebalance our portfolios on a regular basis um, through the communication with the clients because we, um, unless it's like a retail funds or closed end funds, um, uh, especially with the institutional clients, the communication is very important because they don't want to be like notified of big changes um, after they happen, which can materially um, affect the returns and risks of the portfolios. So communication is very important. And we also review and update our investment universe um, periodically. So like, so we check for any like names that we are, uh, we don't uh, need to invest in or that are not fit. Um, and we also check for the names that are not in our current investment universe, but that we, sh that we want to include. And we also um, construct model portfolios um, so uh, for two reasons. Um, one reason can be that we show the model portfolios for potential clients. And also we keep the model portfolios aside in case, you know, we want to like rebalance our portfolios and stuff. And also we update our credit research, uh, the reports upon um, earnings releases, uh, which happen on a quarterly basis. And this is done by the analysts in the team. And occasionally, but uh, these are very important occasions, portfolio managers submit proposals for a new client mandate um, for a business, business expansion and to increase uh, AUMs in, of course, earn fees from the client. Um, and they also attend due diligence by the clients if they are selected um, after submitting the proposals. And the PMs made clients with marketers for pitching or updating um, on a regular basis. And they sometimes launch new projects uh, for business development that's not related to the portfolio management. Um, they also meet regulatory authorities for approval of new products sometimes. So these are just some of the examples that um, I can think of uh, that the PMs do on a daily, uh, weekly, monthly, and annual basis. So why do they do it? Um, on a professional side, the ultimate goal is, of course, to generate access returns uh, while minimizing the risks of the investment for clients. So to improve risk adjusted returns for clients who give their money to the managers with faith. 
Um, diversification of investment assets is on also um, another important reason. So on a personal side, compensation is one thing and self-development is another. Portfolio managers have endless opportunities to learn about um, not just the financial markets and products, but what goes on around the world. They have to know uh, basically everything that affects their portfolios. So the feeling of winning with superior returns all, is also great, to be honest. So if you're a person who is curious, goal-oriented, and competitive, and a team pay player, um, as cliche as it might, may sound, you actually have a chance of becoming a successful portfolio manager. Okay. Well, you can find many charts in different versions that uh, describe the flow of the portfolio management process on the internet or any uh, um, asset management company's website. Uh, and here's a random one that I found on the internet yesterday. So the charts are not so different from one another. So you can just uh, scan them uh, on the internet and have a sense of what, how it works on your own. I'm just not gonna go over this chart. Just So these are some of the things that come to my mind about what credentials PMs should have. First, I think they should gladly accept the continuous learning opportunities and challenges. They should have confidence in their job and value cooperation with those who are in the same business uh, with them because portfolio management is not one person's job. The last three credentials are about more on the ethical stuff. So PM should know and comply with all the rules and regulations at all times. They should manage portfolios while fulfilling their fiduciary duties for the clients and always, um, always honor business ethics while doing their job. So otherwise it takes just a few seconds before a promising portfolio manager to breach simple rules and lose his or her job and reputation at once. So the last four slides are all images. And first, there are some of the use, these are some of the useful resources for anyone who want to build um, financial knowledge. So this, they are um, newspapers like Wall Street Journal and Financial Times, periodicals like The Economist, online sources for news updates, and published uh, scholarly articles you can easily find on um, Google Scholars. And you can also arrange meetings with field experts or attend seminars and webinars as well. So all of these sources are actually quite um, commonly available if you search for them. So go for them. Um, these are the images of excitement for working as a portfolio manager in my opinion. So you're surrounded by competitive and intelligent people who keep inspiring you. You have many resources that will keep you updated and educated. And compensation is quite rewarding as well. On the other hand side, you're subject to frequent layoffs during the financial crisis, especially. Um, and you have to keep running and competing with others, which can be quite stressful from time to time, even if you um, generally enjoy the pressure. And you can also experience the bottoms when the performance of your portfolios does not turn out to be the way you wish it to be. So yeah, it can be hard, but it can also be very fun. Uh, this is what I think the journey of a portfolio manager should be like. A slow, long, establishing journey with close friends who share the same kind of passion and goals as professionals and as individuals as well. So this is it. Thank you all for listening to my lecture today. Um, if you have any questions about fixed income, or the markets or the portfolio management job, you can always send me an email or ask through Professor Kang. So thank you, have a great rest of the day today. Bye.